All right, so like I said, I wanna start off with a clinical case. So you have a 62 year old male, the past medical history that includes hypertension, diabetes, CAD, uh, had an MI, um, now has heart failure with reduced ejection fraction at about 10% and is currently uh, status post implantation of a heart mate free LVAD. Um, when you meet him, he is presenting with acute onset of lightheadedness and shortness of breath in the setting of vomiting and diarrhea for two days. Uh, your initial vital signs, well, you're still trying to get a heart rate because as you know, or as you will shortly find out, uh, these patients are often non-pulsatile. So you go to feel a radial pulse and you can't get one. Um, because they're non-pulsatile, you know you cannot obtain blood pressure as a typical auscultation with your systolic and diastolic. So you obtain a map. Um, rightly so, but your MAP here is noted to be 50, which is obviously low. The patient is somewhat tachypnic with a respiratory rate of 26 breaths per minute. Uh, they are satting okay so far in room air and they are afebrile. When you look at the LVAD, um, it's demonstrating a low flow alarm and uh, not something we ever like to see. The flows are at 1.9 liters per minute, the speed is at 3000 RPM, and your power is at two watts. Okay, so I want you to keep this case in mind as we move through sort of the rest of the lecture. Um, and then sort of lastly, on physical exam, you hear the motor sound, which is good. You wanna hear that continuous motor. Uh, you notice that the JV, JVP is flat. There's no palpable peripheral pulses, but that's not unexpected. And the uh, lower extremities are cool with trace edema. So again, as a quick reminder, all of these patients that have LVADs nowadays have continuous flow devices, meaning they either have an axial rotor or a centrifugal um, pump that basically continuously churns blood. And because of this, you lose systolic and diastolic flow, which has implications, including in order to get a blood pressure, you have to be able to obtain a MAP using a Doppler. And a lot of these patients, especially if they don't have good native heart function, will be non-pulsatile when you go feel for, for example, radial pulses. So a quick review of some parameters. So you see the HeartMate 2 on the left and the HeartMate 3 on the right, two of our more common devices. The other is the Heartware HVAD, which we will look at momentarily. So a couple of things to point out with their parameters. So they are generally the same between devices with the big exception being the pump speed. So for the HeartMate 2, your typical pump speed is anywhere from 8,600 to 10,000 RPM. And again, that basically describes how quickly that motor or impeller is spinning. Um, your pump flow is gonna be about the same independent of the device. So somewhere between four and five liters per minute. And that is basically an approximation or a surrogate of one's cardiac output. And in order to run at that speed to generate that flow, the pump needs to draw a certain amount of power. And your pump power is anywhere from three to four to five, maybe up to six watts. Generally speaking, your pump power should never be double digits. And then the fourth parameter is a pulse index or the pulsatility that we'll again look at momentarily. So these patients really do have a good idea of what their normals are. Um, so of course you wanna ask them, but you should have a general idea of what normal should be as well. Again, remembering, but the thing that differs between these devices is really the pump speed. And when you meet them, this is essentially what they look like, right? This is their system controller, and this is what you can toggle through to look at the various parameters. Currently, the one displayed on the screen is the pump speed. Again, seeing the difference between the HeartMate 2 and the HeartMate 3 in terms of the pump speed. Uh, as promised, here we have the hardware HVAD. Uh, again, the big difference here is going to be the speed, which is anywhere from 2,400 RPM to about 4,200 RPMs. Uh, again, the flow and the amount of power should be about the same. Um, lastly, with respect to flow pulsatility or pulsatility index, so the PI um, typically ranges from three to seven liters per minute. Lower values reflect less native heart function and more reliance on the device or the pump. Uh, higher values reflect greater native heart function and less support on the device itself. Um, and the pulsatility is really the difference here between your peak and your trough that you're getting in terms of the waveform. Um, and the number two is important for a couple of reasons. One, 
your pulsatility. So again, the difference between the peak and trough should be greater than two liters per minute. And the trough should always be above two liters per minute. And we will see what happens when that's not the case. So some basic principles to remember before we get back into our case and discuss suction events. So one, we're dealing with continuous flow devices. Two, all of these patients that have VADs are preload dependent, okay? That means they require volume. And if they're hypovolemic, they're going to get into trouble. Uh, they are all afterload sensitive. Remember, a normal map for these patients is usually, usually between 70 and 90 millimeters of mercury. And if you're running higher than the top of 90, uh, you can get into issues with backflow and heart failure symptoms because you just can't, the pump just can't meet that afterload that the patient has. Uh, also, the patients are both anticoagulated and have antiplatelet therapy, so they're at high risk of bleeding. Uh, yes, you could certainly defibrillate or cardiovert these patients. And if the patient is determined to be pulseless, apneic, obviously unresponsive, and certainly if the pump is off, yes, you can do CPR on these patients. Okay, so let's get back into our clinical case and then dive a little bit deeper into the topic of the discussion, which are suction events. So again, reminder, has a HeartMate 3L VAD, presents with acute onset of lightheadedness and shortness of breath in the setting of volume loss, particularly vom vomiting and diarrhea for two days. Again, unable to obtain that heart rate initially, but they are hypotensive with a MAP of 50, they're tachypnic, uh, they're satting okay for the time being, and they're afebrile. Again, when you go and evaluate the LVAD itself, uh, they have the low flow alarm, which is occurring. Their flows are at 1.9 liters per minute. And now after reviewing those normal parameters, we know this is low, right? Should be around four-ish. Uh, the speed also is low, around 3000 RPM, and the power is two watts. Again, generally hypovolemic in cool lower extremities on exam. Okay, so at this point, you wanna get an EKG in your patient and you appropriately do so, and you notice this. So obviously not good, right? Gives you pause, it's certainly not a normal sinus rhythm. And for those in the audience, you've probably recognized this to be ventricular tachycardia. Uh, the patient is awake and talking, uh, you have a carotid pulse, so this is VT with a pulse. So. How are you putting this together now? Again, you wanna take the overall clinical picture of your patient and what the VAD itself is doing. So volume exam is key. Your patient is hypovolemic based on clinical history and physical exam. They are hypoperfusing as well. So you have a hypoperfusing, hypovolemic patient. You obtain an EKG, which de demonstrates a dysrhythmia, in this case, particularly ventricular tachycardia. Their drive line, so always be looking at the drive line. In this case, it looks fine, it's intact. You notice that their pump speed is lower than typical, right? Their pump speed should be about uh, six or 7,000 RPM, is what the patient tells you. You have a low flow alarm, clearly that's not good. And there it is displayed on the system controller. Okay, so putting this all together, Basically, you're looking at a suction event. And this could be what the screen actually looks like when you pull it up. So it's telling you you're, they're having a low flow alarm for the last seven minutes. The pump flow is 1.6 liters per minute. The speed is lower than typical. The pulsatility index is lower. And it, because of that, it's drawing less amount of power. So what is a suction event? In essence, a suction event occurs when the pump speed, right, the intrinsic speed of the device is higher than the available circulating volume for the patient. And we'll discuss a few reasons why in a minute. Uh, as you can see, looking at the echo, the still image, uh, on the bottom right-hand side of your screen, here on the left, basically you see a cavity that looks well filled. Versus on the right, right here in the dotted circle, you see essentially this cannula, this inflow cannula, sucked up against the septum because of the smaller volume of the LV cavity. So what is the LVAD, LVAD device doing in this case? Well, it is. it knows that it has a lower circulating volume than it typically is used to seeing. So because of that, it is going to automatically reduce its speed to try to compensate. 
and it ultimately it reduces its speed to the point that it gets to a lower set limit and can't go any further. But what you will also see is lower flow. And if it gets too low, as in our case, you're gonna get that low flow alarm. So now getting to your patient, right? The key is volume status. And you wanna get a good evaluation of their volume status. Of course, before we transport anybody, certainly in the inner facility world, you wanna look at your radiology, at least that which is pertinent. You wanna make sure you had looked at the chest X-ray and the positioning of the cannula had looked okay on that. Um, those who are particularly savvy or have access to ultrasound, could it look at the could look at the uh, the heart and evaluate for biventricular function in this case, um, and basically you want to evaluate for chamber size to see what's going on. Um, if you pull up the graphic of what pulsatility would look like in this patient, you'll you'll notice that you'll have something probably looking more like the graph here on the bottom, which demonstrates an empty LV. So on the top with the LV that looks like it's full, basically you have a full LV you have greater stretch, greater contractility of the LV, and therefore a greater pulsatility index. When you have a small or an empty LV, again, you violate that rule of two. So here you have basically the, the pulsatility, the difference being less than two between the peak and the trough, and the trough, as you could see in a number of cases here, is less than two liters per minute. Okay, so what are some causes of suction events? One. In the case of our patient, dehydration. So anything that leads to maybe decreased input as well as increased output could cause it a hemorrhage. So if the patient comes in with a GI bleed, right? We know they're susceptible to GI bleeds due to AV malformations, uh, and they're obviously anticoagulated. So if they're hypovolemic from that standpoint, they can also develop a suction event there. Diuresis, right? These patients are on diuretic regimens. If for whatever reason they are being over diuresed, that can cause issue with volumes. Um, with the heart, they could develop right heart failure uh, acutely in the setting of an RV infarct, uh, a pulmonary hypertensive crisis, or in the setting of obstructive shock. So in both of these cases, you have decreased right heart function, which is going to lead to decreased blood flow to the left side of the heart, which is obviously going to lead to a, a smaller LV cavity. And then lastly, an issue with the VAT itself, in particular, the inflow cannula can become obstructed. So what is our plan? Well, can you cardiovert? Sure, you could cardiovert, right? Uh, you know, at, at bottom line, you have a unstable ventricular tachycardia with pulses, right? So you could certainly cardiovert these patients. Will that fix it? It may not. So what are some other options? Well, again, anti-dysrhythmic anti medications, but again, not likely to fix, fix the underlying issue. So if we know the underlying issue is decreased LV cavity size, due to one of these reasons, and in our case, particularly hypovolemia secondary to GI losses, we wanna fill up that LV and get that inflow cannula away from that septum. So again, give them volume, hydration, hydration, hydration. Start with a 500 cc bolus and reassess and see if they need another one. Lastly, if all of this does not resolve the issue, once they get to the VAD center, the VAD team can come down and go in and actually further reduce that pump speed below its lower set point to help sort of get back in line as you start to give that patient more volume. But again, in the out of hospital environment, we are not doing this. We are giving them hydration. So in summary, if you remember nothing else, remember this. LVAD patients are preload dependent. They need volume. And in the case of a suction event, you have a pump speed that is higher than the available circulating volume that the patient has. In response to that, the VAD is going to decrease its speed. And if it does so, you're ultimately gonna get low flow alarms. Our management, volume, 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 crystalloids. They need crystalloids. Obviously, if they're hemorrhaging, you have a GI bleed, well then they'll need blood in that case. And again, like I said, always good in early communication with the VAD team is going to be helpful. So I thank you for your time. Hopefully you found that helpful. And uh, Chad, I'll kick it over to you if there are any questions. Thanks, Asa. We do have a couple questions here. Um, first question is, is it acceptable to util utilize a Lucas on these patients or is manual CPR recommended? Yeah, awesome question. Um, so 
again, there, there's no unifying uh, recommendation for that. Um, I would say I would continue with, with manual chest compression. If for whatever reason you are, you know, you're responding and there's two of you there, and that's the reason why you have a Lucas device. And the only reason you could perform compressions uh, is by applying the Lucas device. Well, then I would use a Lucas device. But if you have a number of hands, I would stay with manual compressions. All right. Um, if LVAD patients are volume dependent in any type of shock state where fluid won't fix the problem, i.e. sepsis, is there a preferred type of presser advised? Yeah. Good question. So taking your example of sepsis for that patient, um, again, the cornerstone management for sepsis is initially volume resuscitation. And particularly in the setting of these VAD patients, right, they are preload dependent. As soon as they become hypovolemic, they're going to get in trouble. So we want to give them that volume first. Once you think they're still hypoperfusing, but now euvolemic, that's when you would transition to your vasoactive medications. And the vasoactive medication of choice in this case would still be your norepinephrine. Two more real quick ones. Sure. Um, with blood would blood products or something like Hexstem be okay for these patients in the case of hemorrhage with hypovolemia? Good question. Um, so if they, if they have GI losses or if they're over-diuresed, um, stick with crystalloids, okay? LR, plasma light, normal saline. If they have volume depletion secondary to blood loss, I would give them the blood back. Um, again, Units of packed red blood cells, obviously they are anticoagulated and have some sort of antiplatelet therapy going on, but that is a discussion in of itself, whether or not we want to actively reverse these patients. And generally speaking, we want to be very cautious about actively reversing. In an ideal setting, we could just support them through it with red blood cells, um, but the decision to reverse these patients should definitely be made um, in consultation with the VAD team cardiac surgery, and cardiology. All right. And are we creating an additional problem by giving fluids in the field? Are we at risk of putting them in heart failure or fluid overload? Uh, sorry, let me, one more time with that question. You just cut out. Yep. Are we creating an additional problem by giving fluids in the field? Are we putting them at risk for heart failure or fluid overload? Great question. So, Again, it depends upon what the underlying etiology is. So, and that's where that volume exam comes into play. So if your patient is hypovolemic, secondary to GI losses or blood loss, they need volume. Again, this device is going to help them deal with the volume. If they didn't have this device and you're dealing with a patient with the EF of 10%, then yeah, you gotta be really, really careful. But otherwise, this device is gonna help them deal with that volume and that's what they really need. But again, that doesn't mean, you know, put up a liter of fluid, open it up and walk away, right? It is give sort of measured fluid amounts and reassess. So 500 cc bolus, go back and reassess. If they're still volume depleted, yes, give them more volume. Uh, you are not going to get in trouble in that case. You'll get in trouble if we sort of miss the boat and now they are hypervolemic from all the fluid we're giving them. We're not constantly reassessing. Okay, any other questions? Yep. Um, desired INR for these patients, like for their anticoagulation. Yep. Good. So, uh, you know, that's, it's a tough question because a lot of, you know, you could easily say sort of like two to three on these patients, but that's a little bit of an oversimplified answer because, uh, they are very, very tightly and finely managed depending upon their individual risk for thrombosis and bleeding. So they may, you know, the VAD team may be running the patient a little bit higher because they've had a lot of thrombotic events. Another patient, they may be running on the lower side because they've had a lot of GI bleed events. So yeah, you could use that like two to three range, but ultimately the patient may have their own individual sort of goal based on their intrinsic, you know, clotting ability versus bleeding. Uh, again, the same with the antiplatelets. Some patients are on 81 aspirin. Some patients are on 325 of aspirin. Just depends on what their intrinsic clotting versus bleeding risk is. Thanks, Asa. Um, there's one more question in the chat. Um, if you wouldn't mind grabbing that and just responding to that uh, separately, yep. and we're going to head on to the next presentation. No problem. So next up, 
next up we got uh <clears throat> james boomhauser uh boomhauer sorry from uh, boston med flight so uh boomer it's all yours thank you very much uh awesome presentation asa thank you so much um we are going to spend probably 10 12 minutes here talking about uh self-care psychologic first aid and pandemics uh, and as you can tell from the beautiful quality of my microphone I'm a tiny bit sick, so bear with me as I cough, gag, wheeze. Uh, if you hear my mic mute out all of a sudden, it's likely because I'm having a coughing fit and don't want to have that over the air. So real quick rundown, if we've never met or we've never talked before, uh, my name is James Boomheller. Uh, as Sam said, I'm a paramedic with Boston MedFlight, been a paramedic now for the better part of 16 years, been in EMS for 18, done kind of all the pieces of the puzzle. I run Boston MedFlight's peer support team. Uh, I'm also a member of the Echo Fast peer support team and the Rhode Island State Critical Incident Stress Management team. And I'm currently studying to become a licensed mental health counselor with a focus on emergency and military personnel. I run a mental health and suicide awareness advocacy campaign called Stay Fit for Duty. And if you'd like, you can scan this QR code and not only see some of the resources that we're gonna talk about today, <clears throat> but a whole bunch of other stuff related to the mental health peer support and suicide advocacy realm. So feel free to scan that. If you're not intrigued enough yet, I'll put it up again at the very end if I've won you over. Uh, Sam did a beautiful job talking about yesterday's crew. Uh, I don't know about you, but I received a total of 33, three, three calls, texts, DMs, random, hey, oh my God, are you okay? Uh, for those of you that have friends that know you're in the medical helicopter and that's about it, uh, I'm fairly convinced that our colleagues know that there is one medical helicopter in the world and we are all on it at any given time. Um, it didn't matter that it was two states away. It didn't matter that it wasn't the same paint scheme. It was just people were concerned and people were scared. And it was a tremendously scary event. It was scary for us. It was scary for the people that aren't in aeromedical services. And I can only imagine the stress and the fear that the crew themselves were under, which is an excellent time for me to bring up this idea of what makes events traumatic. Traumatic events follow a number of different categories as detailed and defined by the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, the primary one that I want to mention here is an event that changes the way you understand the world, yourself, or others. And to spare you an hour-long thesis on the topic, the take-home from this is super simple. You do not need to be directly involved in an event to make it traumatic. So if you came home from work yesterday and your significant other hugged you a little tighter or your mother called you three times because a helicopter fell out of the sky and it reminded every single person how fragile life is and how tremendously intrinsically dangerous the profession that we all provide can be, and it's sticking with you a little bit and it's bothering you a little bit, you have a right to those emotions. You do not have to say, well, I can only imagine how stressed out the crew is. So who am I to try to say that like, I need to talk to someone or, you know, how weak of me to have to, you know, talk to somebody about this because I wasn't one of those three. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. So please know that you do not have to be in the mix. It doesn't have to happen to you for it to be traumatic. I also wanna take a minute and talk about the state of our healthcare system and the extra stress that we all get to enjoy each and every day. A uh, quick formula for burnout here is really quite simple. It's a combination of, one would argue, unrealistically high expectations with low control, and that is burnout. I'm just gonna let everybody simmer for a second and tell me if their job gives them really, really high expectations be it in staffing, be it in showing up, be it in changing bases, be it in the job you do each and every day. You certainly don't have to answer in the chat, but just to yourself, is what my job asked me to do each and every day a high expectation? In some cases, in some systems, in some examples, unrealistically so. And then how much control do I have over that outcome? Uh, if any of you follow any of the big meme pages on social media, uh, this made its way around my page, uh, along with a number of other pages yesterday, um, who also works for any type of administrator or leadership that doesn't super believe that self-care is a thing, 
Uh, I'm also highly inclined to believe that the same people that send idiotic messages like this are the same people that don't exactly say, come to me if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, or if you need to talk, right? We've all worked for these people. We're not gonna sit here and say right, wrong, or indifferent, but this is the state of our job in the day-to-day. -day. It can absolutely feel like a never-ending cycle back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And I made it two years without getting COVID, two, two whole years. And then I go away for one day and wear a mask the entire time and pop positive the next day. Infuriating, right? It just keeps going round and round and round. Early in this pandemic, we knew that this was going to affect the mental health and well-being of our healthcare providers. And in response to that, we've pushed many of our colleagues to their absolute breaking point. We had some Zooms and some complimentary yoga and we talked about it and it was a buzzword, but did we really make any actionable change? Or did we just push and push and push our healthcare providers until they collapsed? I can tell you for those of you that are on the transport side of the coin like myself, this is every day. For those of you that aren't familiar with the state of Massachusetts and its surrounding accoutrement, these are not small hospitals. This isn't Boston Regional Medical Center. This isn't XYZ Community Three Bed ER. This is the Mass General Hospital, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, the Beth Israel System, which is a three campus system. Leahy, Winchester, BMC, Tufts, Cape Cod, UMass, South Shore, Good Sam. These are humongous institutions with no beds just straight up no vacancy, no room at the end. And what we are asking our transport teams to do because of that. Myself and a tremendously talented flight nurse colleague spent seven hours at a bedside about a month and a half ago because when a very sick COVID patient went into cardiac arrest, we lost our ICU bed acceptance. We couldn't leave. We couldn't pack up our stuff and go home. We spent seven hours at bedside. And for the nurses in the room, I'm a paramedic. That is not my jam. I'm very, very good at what I do, but spending seven hours with one human is well outside of my comfort zone and probably the root cause of some of my relationship issues, but it is not how I practice medicine. And it is tremendously unnerving to do transport medicine without a place to transport to. Naturally, one of the things we're going to talk about, <laughs> excuse me, is burnout. And one of the most important things I need you all to know about burnout is it is not terminal. We decide whether burnout is terminal or temporary. We talk about burnout and we talk about the sake of our mental health because Suicide is still the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. In 2017, three years pre-pandemic, five years ago, we lost 47,000 people to suicide. In the medical community, our nurses have a tremendously high rate of suicide with our male nursing colleagues dying by suicide at a rate three times greater than their female counterparts. Our physician colleagues die by suicide daily. And in a big cohort lump in the eyes of the United States Census Bureau, your first responder is an EMT, a paramedic, a police officer, a firefighter, and an emergency RN. And we lose a first responder every four days to suicide. In 2019, we recognized that this was reaching an all-time high. And that was one year pre pandemic. So we know that this is just going up and up and up. So I want to take the eight or so minutes that I have left with you and talk about some fundamentals of self-care. First and foremost, you have to understand that the emotions you're feeling right now are not abnormal. I'm sorry for the double negative. They are a normal response to an abnormal event. That said, any thoughts of self-harm or suicide need to be addressed immediately with crisis teams and professional help. 
we do want to ensure your safety while we normalize what you're feeling. Tiny wins, small wins, if you will. They are every day in medicine. They're not always as glorious as pulling an infant out of a downed helicopter. They're not always glorious as crushing the tube that anesthesia couldn't get before you got there. But wins exist each and every day. And I challenge you on your shifts to find the wins. Did you have a good partner? Did you go to that taco joint that you guys love? Did you get out of that horrific ICU transport because you duty timed out of it? What little wins did you have in the day? Because I promise, even on your worst day, there was a win in there somewhere. And it's imperative that while we focus on what is going wrong, we also devote some time to what is going right. When we talk about self-care, I really, really need to make sure that we're not just dumping a whole bunch of money at Target and a whole bunch of money at Sephora and buying things that look pretty and smell nice and convince us that we are actually doing something productive. If that's your jam, if you just need an hour long soak in a tub, by all means, go to town. But if you're just buying things to buy things because it says self-care on the box, that is likely not what is actually relaxing and enriching you, allowing you to recenter, refocus, and heal. I'll admit that I used to say that your self-care has to be outside of medicine. Um, I, I no longer believe that to be true. Um, I actually think that your self-care can be part of medicine if it's allowing you to do all of these things. I'm staying for Dan's talk and anticoagulation because it's a topic that I love and it's a topic that I need to use all the time. Reviewing for that can be very much self-care inducing. I'm relaxed. I'm in my office. I'm hanging out. My girlfriend's with me. Everything's grand. And I'm looking at protocols in the right headspace that can still be a safe and appropriate way to practice some self-care. I would prefer it to not be medicine related and I work hard to make sure that I have non-medicine related things that I can do, but it's not an end all be all. I'm not gonna do this exercise with you today because I don't think I have the residual capacity to do it right now, but I want you to follow along with this GIF as soon as I start it. And I want you to recognize two things. I want you to recognize that it's relatively easy to do and I also want you to recognize the notable lack of yoga poses or long drawn out and dramatic ohms as you're doing it. So you inhale to the count of this, you hold your breath, you exhale, and you hold your breath. Now you do that in two cycles. And it is a beautiful, beautiful way to bring yourself down from de-stress where our sympathetic nervous system is just pounding out all the chemicals that are keeping us all sorts of wired. I joke, this is the inability to attach a lure lock to a needleless syringe, right? When I can't connect those two, I need to take a couple deep breaths because I'm starting to lose my fine motor skills. And that means I'm way out of my head. You can do this all the time. You can do it before the stressful airway, you can do it before the stressful shift, you can do it during the stressful shift, and you can do it on your way into work or home or whenever. It is a tremendous immediate release, a little reminder to your nervous system that you are actually the one in control and that you can go about this the right way. You got to be super, super cognizant of your fundamentals. I'm going to laugh if I tell you to get eight hours of sleep. I don't believe it and we don't necessarily know it to be true. We know it's important, but we don't necessarily know if that number is exactly what it needs to be for good continued performance and for psychological well-being. That number seems to be anywhere from about six to eight, but we also know that in the real world, purposeful rest is just as important. Can you sit on the recliner for 10 minutes with your phone off? Can you lie down next to your partner or in your bed without falling asleep? Rest and sleep are important. Rest is often much, much easier to attain, especially in really stressful periods. In imminent crisis, calories matter more than the quality of those calories. This is why you see in crisis events, people just come with whatever food they can grab. That's totally fine in crisis. Make sure when you're not in crisis mode that you're also paying attention to the quality of those calories. That matters much as well. As much as is humanly possible, please try to tie up inner hydration. I know it's easier said than done, especially in the flight world, but 
it is still really, really, really important. Grab a carabiner, put it on your water bottle and keep it in the aircraft with you. You need to stay hydrated. It's a tremendous component of your self-care. Boxing out the time that is yours and that is not your employer's is tremendously important. I do not answer Everbridge notifications or emails on my day off unless I'm doing administrative or education work. I don't. If they need me, they will get a hold of me. And then I choose whether or not I want to answer. You have to be able to dedicate that time to you. You give them your time when you're at work. I understand staffing is terrible. I understand we are in dire need for humans. I get it. I see every text that I get. And when I can help, I help. But when I can't, I have to devote that time to myself. And that's a very, very important skill for you to practice. Many of you know that peer support is my jam. I'm a huge proponent of good peer support and I'm a huge proponent of watching it be utilized. It is quickly becoming the standard of care throughout employee mental health. In many institutions, all of the right pieces are there. They're just not necessarily put together yet. Very minimal costs and easily recuperated through staff retention. We'll take other times or I can talk to people interested offline about talking about the intricacies of creating formalized peer support, but peer support in and of itself is tremendously, tremendously valuable. I'll also ask you to cautiously lean on your employee assistance program. Do you have one? What do you know about it? And can you utilize it? If you're an in-hospital system or affiliated with a hospital, what networks do they have? Do you have a social work team, a chaplaincy, or religious services? And again, one another. Can you lean on your team and can you guys work together to get through this period of time? All of these resources here are again available on that QR code that I sent you with links to each web page. I won't take up too much time for the Q&A to go over those. That QR code is right here. And although I'm just a couple minutes over, I want to thank you guys for your time and attention. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Boomer. That was awesome. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I think we're going to keep rolling. Boomer, if you will stay on, maybe somebody's got some questions in, in the chat. Um, I think we're going to kick over to uh, Pooja and Phil uh, for our next one because I haven't seen any questions. Um, so Phil and Pooja, you're up. Uh, Boomer, thank you again for, for being here. Sam, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, go for it. Okay. So I'm Phil and this is Pooja and we're from Hopkins Transport Team and we're gonna be talking about pediatric trauma pearls. Oh. We have no disclosures. So a little bit about pediatric trauma. So injuries are the number one cause of death for children and adolescents. The most significant threat to a child's well-being is trauma, and most pediatric injuries are preventable. Effective resuscitation of the pediatric trauma patient can lower mortality by up to 30%. So children are not little adults. So how do children get hurt? So I always say it's they're meeting their developmental milestones. So for example, infants sustain their injury in the home environment. A big developmental milestone for this age group is rolling over. So they roll off beds and changing tables. They put everything into their mouth and they suck on it. So they're really prone to choking. And unfortunately, this age group is susceptible to child abuse because sometimes they just can't stop crying. Toddlers, our toddlers are on the move. They're inquisitive and curious. They fall out of windows, they fall off decks. They're very prone to drowning in the bathtubs, they're out looking at the pools or the neighbor's fish pond. Our school age children, they're exhibiting their independence. And so they're on bikes, riding in front of cars, pedestrian struck, chasing a ball out into the street. And our adolescents, they're our big risk takers. They're under a lot of peer pressure. So basically whatever the newest TikTok craze is, that's how they're getting hurt. We see MVCs sports related injuries, and unfortunately over the last couple years, an increase in suicide. So why do we miss important assessment information? And basically the biggest reason is that we have a lack of systematic approach. So we should always be approaching traumas in the same manner, and that's A, B, C, D, and E. And we'll talk about the 
that a little bit later. The other thing is that pediatric calls can be really stressful. There's family members and parents that add a whole nother realm of anxiety to the scene. Unless you're a dedicated pediatric program, you're gonna have rarely used equipment in your truck because you're predominantly doing adults. You might be unfamiliar with normal vital signs for age or normal development. Our team here at Hopkins transfers from birth to 21 years of age, and that's a big span to know what's normal. And last but not least, children's initial response to severe injury can be subtle. This might be the most important slide I have, know what's normal. And when I say know what's normal, know what's normal for each age group. Use a reference card. We use it, the kids card here at Hopkins. My transport team has a protocol book with references. I know DC Children's has an online app and I know there's lots of other online apps around. So just know what's normal before you go into a trauma scene. A lot, of hospital use, a lot of hospitals use the Braslow tape. That's a good reference as well. So let's talk about the principal causes of death shortly after trauma. And in children, it's generally airway obstruction. And we'll talk a little bit about their airway in just a minute, but it's easy for them to get an obstructed airway. They die from respiratory insufficiency, and that's usually related to a CNS injury for them. And then, of course, shock from hemorrhagic shock that's either not recognized and or not treated appropriately. So the systematic approach that we're talking about is really the primary survey, and that's no different from pediatrics than adults. And it's a rapid identification of threats to life. So it's the A, B, C, D, E approach, and it should always be the same for every trauma patient. Assessment and management in this phase occur simultaneously. So we'll talk a little bit about each phase. First, let's talk about airway. Always go to the airway first in a pediatric trauma case. Is it patent? Is it obstructed? You know, the airways are really tiny in kids. And so is there a foreign body in it? Is the airway protected? Does the child have the ability to have a cough and a gag? Or is the GCS just so disabled that they're no longer able to protect their airway? And you wanna always optimize oxygenation and ventilation while protecting the C-spine. A little anatomical differences in children, and this is generally true in children less than three, is they have a large occiput and that flexes their neck in a supine position, which can cause airway obstruction. They have big tongues and small mouths, floppy epiglottises. They have a narrow, airway period, and it's so easy to lose that airway. So B is breathing. This is a really important slide too. Hypoventilation is the most common cause of cardiac arrest in children. So when you're evaluating breathing, count a respiratory rate, put it into a normal category, a high or below, below normal category. Auscultation of breath sounds, visualizing the chest wall for, for symmetric, symmetry expansion and accessory muscle use. And then of course, pulse socks and continuous capnography are really good assessment tools to be using. So some of the life-threatening chest injuries that we do see, and they're not very common in pediatrics, obviously is pneumothoraces that need to be decompressed, a hemothorax, and actually the chest injury that we do see a lot in children is a pulmonary contusion. And while there's not any immediate intervention for this injury, just knowing that it's there and it could cause problems with oxygenation and ventilation down the road. So then we'll move on to circulation. So early IV access is imperative. It should be within 60 and 90 seconds. And as you can see from the slide on the bottom right, sometimes it's really difficult in the little ones. So actually our go-to is just an IO. We'll talk a little bit about shock. So shock in children is really difficult to diagnose and the increased physiological reserve of a child allows them to maintain their blood pressure even in the presence of shock. So what these kids do is they increase their heart rate a little bit, mildly, and all of a sudden their blood pressure is perfectly fine. This actually is one of my favorite slides and it's the classification of shock in children. And it's four classes and it talks about how much blood volume and what vital signs you could expect. 
And so if you look at class two, that's 30% of a blood volume loss for these kids. And they may only present with mild tachycardia and a normal blood pressure. And it isn't until they get into class three, which is a blood loss volume of 30 to 40%, that you're actually seeing changes in vital signs in terms of moderate tachycardia and decreased blood pressure. So that's a real big thing for pediatrics. So how do you treat shock in kids? Well, restore circulating volume, a rapid infusion of 20 mLs per kilo of normal saline or LR, and it matters not, that's a whole nother 10 minute talk. And so get it in fast. You could use what we call the push-pull method, which is attaching a stopcock to a syringe and an IV bag, pushing, pulling up the fluid in the syringe and pushing it into the patient as rapidly as possible. If three boluses do not restore your vital signs or assessment findings, now it's time to think about blood. And you want to administer 10 mLs per kilo of O negative or pack red blood cells. And at this point, you need to start considering your mass transfusion protocol. Now that looks different from institution to institution and certainly from program to program, but, it's, but the concept is the same. It's adding FFP and platelets into the mix to be able to counteract the uh, coagula coagulopathic state that hemorrhagic shock brings. And then of course, stop the bleed. And I always teach my team what, what I call goal-directed therapy. So if you're choosing to do an intervention, in your mind, you have a positive effect that you think you're gonna obtain and perhaps even a negative effect that might come of it. But the most important thing is that after you do the intervention is to reassess, reassess, and reassess. D is for disability. Everybody is very familiar with the Glasgow Coma Scale. In pedi the pediatric Glasgow Coma Scale is generally used in children five and younger. And the biggest difference is the verbal part of it. It's, it's made or adapted for the developmental needs of children under five. E is exposure, so full exposure of the patient reveals underlying injuries. And of, co of course, with exposure in children comes hypothermia. Kids are super susceptible to hypothermia. They have a large body surface area to body mass, thin skin, lack of fat. And we all know that hypothermia accentuates the effects of shock. So do whatever you could do to keep the child warm, whether that's heated blankets, trans warmers, keeping the back of your ambulance heat on or warm resuscitation fluids. And I always say a hypothermic child will develop shock and a child in shock will develop hypothermia. So after the primary survey is complete and you've treated all immediate threats to life, now you can move on to your secondary survey, which is basically a head to toe examination you always want to continually reevaluate your primary survey. And having a well-practiced systematic approach keeps everyone focused on the priorities on hand. And that's what I have. All right, uh, Phil and Pooja, we have two questions. Um, if you have questions, please make sure you're putting those in the chats. But uh, the first question is, um, what do you think, um, is there an infection risk with the push-pull method? No. So everything we use with the push-pull method is a um, sterile stopcock, your IV line. It's a closed system, um, just as if you were putting it on a pressure bag or hanging it through um, an IV pump. So there's no increased infection risk. If anything, I would say um, infiltration is a higher risk with a push-pull method. So constantly assessing your IV um, would be important. All right, thanks. Um, and then second question, what are your thoughts on using lidocaine when you place your IO in patients that are not coding? Do you so use lidocaine great. with, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Do you use lidocaine with every patient? No, so we very rarely use lidocaine when placing IOs. Um, I have never had an IO myself. I'm sure there's some EMS out there that have tried it on themselves. 
Um, but they say that the flush and the expansion of the bone marrow actually hurts worse than the actual drilling. So whether you're expanding that bone marrow with lidocaine or with saline, it matters not. Um, it's just that initial flush that's going to hurt, and then afterwards, subsequent fluids or flushes should feel better than the first, if that makes sense. So we don't um, waste our lidocaine or waste um, flushing with lidocaine. Uh, we don't do that in our practice. Okay, uh, thanks. And what would your minimum age be with the push-pull fluid boluses? Obviously not for neonates, greater than six months, greater than a year. So for the push-pull, if I have a neonate, um, say a three kilo, and we're giving a 20 per kilo bolus, I would just use 10 cc flushes. Um, no need to do a push-pull. So it depends on the volume of the um, fluids that I'm gonna be giving. Well, and that helps me decide if I'm gonna do a push pull versus just using um, flushes. The goal is whatever you can do to get it in um, within five minutes um, is how you wanna deliver your fluids. All right, thanks, uh, Phil and Pooja. And I think we're getting ready to kick it over to Anne. Yeah, so uh, I think we're gonna keep rolling here. Thank you again, uh, Phil and Pooja. Uh, it looks like Susan asked a question in the Q&A, if you guys could hop on there and uh, and do that um so next up is uh my favorite nurse practitioner in the whole wide world um uh, my wife so uh and uh, i'm excited to see your presentation all right can you guys hear me okay All right, perfect. All right, thank you so much for having me. My name is Anne Matei. I'm a acute care nurse practitioner at Shock Trauma, primarily staffing the critical care resuscitation unit there. So I'm really happy to discuss the management of type A aortic dissections today. I certainly don't have any disclosures to make, and this is just a general discussion of aortic management uh, for dissection, so certainly not going against any medical directorship that you may have regarding the specific disease process. All right, so starting first, I think it's important just to refresh our memories and defining what a type A dissection is. And so there are several different classifications, either the Stanford or the DeBakey that classifies this. Throughout the lecture, I'll be referring to the Stanford definitions, which is type A or type B. And so really these definitions are where the dissection occurs in proximity to the left subclavian artery, which is highlighted here. And so Anything proximal to that is deemed a type A dissection. And you can see that this is a surgical emergency because it can cause a whole host of problems. The great vessels are located up here, including the carotids. It can extend down into the coronary arteries, the aortic valve, and then the heart itself, the pericardium. Anything distal to this left subclavian is a type B or beyond that is kind of how I remember that. And certainly any of the branch vessels off of the descending aorta are susceptible to ischemia or injury. So this picture here is a cross section of the aorta. And I really want you guys to remember this when we are talking about management, because this is why management is so important. So the aorta is a built off of uh, three different layers. And so with a dissection, that intimal layer is dissected away from the media. And so you end up getting this double barreled vessel where there's a section that is truly perfused and then some false perfusion. This leads to a whole host of uh, problems and ischemia. Uh, this can uh, further dissect either proximally or distally, depending on how the patient's managed. And certainly the ultimate risk is as this continues to dissect, you have the risk of the entire aorta rupturing. Um, all right, so looking a little bit about more morbidity and mortality in this population. So the actual prevalence of type A dissections is very uncommon. Uh, we're not gonna get into the risk factors that predispose you uh, in this limited time we have together today. But what I think it's really important to focus on is even patients who present with that very classical chest pain, 38% of those patients aren't diagnosed uh, in a timely manner. There's a delay with it. Um, and so, uh, a lot of these times the patients are missed. Um, why this is important is the 
clinical symptoms that are oftentimes exuded by these patients really kind of mask or mimic other disease processes, whether they have neurological complaints, some syncope, or even some uh, ischemia that's picked up. So it really acts as a clinical chameleon, which delays the, the initial diagnosis. And what this means for you as the transport provider is by the time you are seeing this patient to transport them, they are well into their disease course, hours into their disease course. So looking specifically at the mortality rates here, um, 20% uh, suffer instant death, but you can see hour by hour, it greatly increases. So every hour that goes by increases the patient's mortality by 2%. And so I really kind of challenge you to think about the patient population that you're transferring and think about uh, the mortality risk that this has compared to those patients. It's extremely high. Uh, and so for on average, the patients that are transferred into the CCRU are probably about six and a half to seven hours uh, from their initial diagnosis into a tertiary medical center. And so you can see the mortality rate there is extremely high. All right, so moving on to management, the first thing before we should even be concerned about treating these patients pharmacologically is getting a good assessment. I'm not talking about bringing in your Fisher-Price stethoscope and listening to breath sounds. This really needs to be a very pointed but detailed examination. And so with any arch vessel involvement up here, uh, there's a two or three times higher mortality rate. The carotids are affected about 40% of the time with a type A dissection, which leads to a high risk of ischemic stroke. These are things that as the accepting uh, team, we absolutely need to know. Um, and if somebody has stroked secondary to a dissection, their mortality rate increases to about 80%, so extremely high. Um, the other focused exam that I want you to go through really, really quick is very quickly looking for pulses, seeing if there are any different blood pressure variations on upper extremities, certainly not spending minutes and minutes with the Doppler trying to assess for it. I literally poke on their abdomen to see if it's peritonitic or not, ask them to move their legs to rule out paraplegia, and then very quickly touch their feet to see if I get a sense of, of pulses present or not present. And we're going to talk a little bit about the assessment of, of the cardiac specific uh, problems that can occur here. So next, I want you to look up at the monitor. And so if for any reason you're seeing hypotension or bradycardia in this patient, you absolutely need to pause and ask a couple more questions and figure out why this is happening. In the hypotensive or bradycardic type A dissection, if you treat them classically, you will absolutely aid in the mortality rate going up. And so the things that you need to find out and investigate are, is this patient having a STEMI, tamponade, or aortic regurge? And so with STEMIs, uh, about 7% of type A dissections will dissect in through their right coronary artery, causing an acute inferior MI. So certainly that would be a problematic uh, in treating just that versus the dissection, super complicated. Uh, the next thing is tamponade. Uh, I know not everybody has the ability to do bedside echo, but kind of add this to your list of why you should advocate for yourself and for your program to become savvy in this. You can very, very quickly throw a probe on a patient and see if they're in tamponade. And this is just because the dissection has extended into the pericardium, resulting in a very large pericardial effusion, uh, causing physiological tamp tamponade. And then finally, assessing to see if the patient has any degree of acute aortic regurge. This is very prevalent. In fact, it happens in about 70% of patients uh, with type A dissections. And so the dissection can kind of dissect through the aortic valve and it pushes the cusp of the aortic valve into the left ventricle. And so you end up getting this wide blown out aortic regurge. So pretty much for any of these, the inferior MI, tamponade, or aortic regurge, if you're giving them beta blockers, you're taking away their compensation, and you're absolutely going to make this patient bottom out and increase their mortality. So it's really, really important if you see this in a type A dissection to, to kind of pause with that. All right, so this is the bread and butter of how we manage these patients. So anti-impulse therapy is well described in the cardiothoracic literature as to how we prevent the shearing force. 
Uh, and so the shearing force is really determined by the change in pressure over time. And you can see this graphically represented here. So I'm not an artist, but I'm hopeful that this really drives the point home. And so here you have your patient that's arrived. This is their systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Let's just call it 202 over 97, extremely hypertensive, okay? So what we can see here is that the upstroke here is pretty pretty severe, right? Very steep. And so this upstroke right here is what the aortic uh, pressure is seeing beat to beat. So extremely high right here. And what we wanna do is kind of prevent that to decrease further dissection from occurring. And so maybe with best intentions, we think that if we give a vasodilator, we can bring that pressure down. When in fact, what happens when a vasodilator is administered in isolation without a beta blocker, you end up decreasing the pressure, but as a compensation mechanism, you end up having in increased chronotropy and inotropy. And so you can see here that that upstroke is severely increased reflected by that green line. And so that is uh, the sheer uh, input that the aortic wall in the dissection is seeing. And so you're actually exacerbating that pressure uh, quite significantly. What we'd like to see is the administration of beta blockers first. And so here the blue line is representing a beta blocker. You can see that the heart rate is slowed, but what is most important is you're gonna see that that uh, upstroke is severely dampened, uh, indicating that that shearing force is significantly decreased to that uh, injured aorta. And so ideally what we'd like to see uh, is the combination of a beta blocker and if necessary, you can see here with the blue line that it brings down the pressure a little bit, but probably not enough. So bring the heart rate down first, decrease that shearing force, and then administering a vasodilator. And so that's kind of reflected in the green here. And that's ideally what we'd like to see for the patient uh, to, to kind of worse to prevent worsening of their dissection. So what are the specific goals? You know, this is extremely debated, but based upon the AHA guidelines and most experts in cardiothoracic medicine right now, the goal is to get the heart rate 60 or less, and then the systolic blood pressure 100 to 110. Certainly keeping in mind, you want the patient to be perfusing. Um, be aware of pseudo hypotension. If you have pulsar pressure differences uh, in their upper extremities, whether it's invasive or non-invasive, you certainly want to be using the high, higher of the two uh, to manage their blood pressure and heart rate. All right, so the management is really broken up into three big components. And the first one is treat pain. I think this is missed uh, significantly. So I really encourage you to start your management with this and then quickly move on to the other therapies. Remembering that their aorta is dissecting at this point, it is incredibly painful for them. And it acts as a very potent vasopressor. Without pain control, you really are not gonna be able to to get the benefit of your other pharmacological agents. Second is beta blockers. We're gonna talk a little bit about that, but remember it's key to get those on board first to decrease that shearing force and then vasodilators that allow us to drop the blood pressure. All right, so the pharmaceutical agents that we're gonna go over, again, most patients places have specific protocols. So certainly not going against what you've been uh, you know, guided to use there, but just to have a little bit of a discussion of the most common agents. So in regards to analgesia, you certainly have a whole host of opioids that you could use. I personally prefer uh, using fentanyl. It has a really nice quick onset and quick half-life. The only time I think you should be a little cautious with this, uh, the, the old grandmas that come in, uh, I have clinically just seen so much of this where, you know, they're slightly normotensive, not hypotensive, but normotensive and tachycardic. And I give them a slug of 50 of, of fentanyl, which is nothing to most of our patients. They drop their heart rate, which is their compensation and start botting them out their pressure. And so anytime you see somebody with normotension or slightly hypotension, uh, I think just start really slow. It seems silly to start with 25, but you can always give more. It's really hard to take it back. So start with slow uh, doses. All right, and then exploring our beta blockers, the two most common are Esmolol and Lobetalol. I much prefer Esmolol, uh, mostly because of the quick onset uh, and uh, quick 
uh, offset. And so if I run into a problem where I've turned it on and my patient is now becoming bradycardic, I can quickly turn it off and within one to two minutes it's cleared. Um, the problems with this is you have to keep in mind that you really absolutely for a tachycardic patient to get them well rate controlled, you gotta administer the bolus uh, and it ends up being a high volume, which is more concerning for me in the ICU as than you as the transport, but it is a high volume drip. All right, so then we have labetalol, which seems great. It should be targeting alpha and beta. Remembering though that it primarily targets beta. And so if you've given several doses of labetalol and you've gotten your heart rate to come down a little bit, but you're not really seeing a significant change in your blood pressure, you're probably gonna have to move on to a second agent. It just is not that strong of an alpha. The problem with albedol is it's much longer. You can see that the half-life is about two to six hours. You can definitely run into some trouble here. The other thing that I wanted to mention with albedol is, although it's nice not to have a drip to transport, uh, pushing labetalol really kind of makes this seesaw roller coaster with a patient's heart rate and blood pressure. And that's extremely stressful in increasing the shearing effect of that dissection. And so drips, uh, if possible, are much better. All right, and then finally, moving on to the most common vasodilator uh, uh, agents that we have. So probably most prevalent is the nicardipine. It's easily and readily available. The problem with nicard nicardipine, as you probably well know, is that it has a longer half-life. And so if you're titrating it every five minutes and you're you know, aggressively doing so to try to get this patient's blood pressure under control, you finally get it there, oftentimes we overshoot. And so even if I turn my drip off, it's hanging on for the next 15 minutes. And so that can really get you, get you in some trouble, that long half-life. And so uh, kind of an alternative to that, which I know is not available to many places and it's a little bit more costly, is clavidipine. And so this is beautiful because it has a really quick onset and really quick half-life. The benefit, or excuse me, the drawbacks to that, or it's a lipid solution, it's limited availability, and it is a little bit more costly. And then finally, I'll mention nitroprusside. And so this kind of historically was the first line agent in using dissection or for treatment of dissections. You know, it's not a great drug. It's not easily titrated. There's a whole host of side effects with it. So certainly wouldn't be my choice as the primary agent only kind of adding this on if the patient's having refractory hypertension. I think uh, this is kind of well documented, but just wanted to say you absolutely don't see hydralazine listed here. It's incredibly um, uh, forceful against a aortic uh, wall shearing. And so certainly hydralazine should not be used uh, as a vasodilator in these patients. So my take home points for you is remembering that type A dissections are truly a surgical emergency. Although their prevalence is not very high, their mortality is absolutely very high. I would argue probably one of the highest mortalities of the patients that you transfer. Every hour that they have the dissection increases their mortality by 2%. I really encourage you to find a way to get a quick focused assessment in before you kind of treat them with the typical beta blockers and vasodilatory agents. Anytime you're seeing bradycardia or hypotension, you absolutely need to pause before treating. Take a look and see if they're having a STEMI, some degree of a pericardial effusion that has caused tamponade physiology, or if they're in acute aortic regurge. And then taking a look at the anti-impulse therapies, remembering to give analgesia very early on and throughout your treatments to allow your other pharmaceutical agents to really kind of get the best bang for the buck. Uh, beta blockers should be administered first and then vasodilatory agents. Remember, this is the only hypertensive emergency that you absolutely have to get the heart rate and blood pressure down very quickly. So do so quite aggressively. Our goals are a heart rate of 60 and systolic blood pressure of 100 to 110. And then I really encourage you to become extremely familiar with whatever medications you have in your protocol or you typically use with these patients in order to safely and best take care of them. The time to kind of figure out how they're going to work and, and their uh, pharmacological profiles is not when you have an acute dissection in front of you. All right, I am happy to take any questions you may have.
Great, thanks. And um, we have do have a couple questions, but we're running short on time. So I'm going to do one question, and then sure. if you could grab those in the chat after um, we start the next presentation, we'd appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. All right, so if a patient's on a beta blocker like Esmolol and heart rate is still high in the 80s and BP is borderline systolic in the 90s, what would you recommend um, for management at that point? Yeah, so, you know, I think uh, further supplementing, you can increase your Esmolol, um, make sure that you have bolus the Esmolol. Um, certain protocols will allow you to re-bolus every time you upward titrate the Esmolol. So looking kind of at your protocols, I certainly don't want to encourage you to work outside of those. And then really look and make sure that the patient is properly given the, uh, their analgesics. All right, thanks, Ann. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ann. So up next is my second favorite nurse practitioner in the whole wide world, uh, Dan. So uh, Dan, you're up. All right. Um, I'm guessing uh, that everybody can hear me anytime technology is involved it always makes me a little anxious. But uh, Sam, you'll tell me, can everybody hear me right? Okay, you're good, good Dan. All you're right. Good. So this is going to be all right, this is going to be a little bit like drinking from a fire hose, but that's sort of the point of this rapid fire thing. Let's uh, talk about coagulation reversal. And to do that, we have to talk just a little bit about normal coagulation. We're going to talk a little bit about um, the anticoagulants that you're most commonly going to encounter. And then we're going to talk about when reversal is indicated. So these guidelines are specific to reversal of ICH. Um, we could talk about reversal in lots of other arenas, but I think ICH is where we most commonly see it. So that's what we're going to talk about. And I can always address that in questions and what time we have. So <clears throat> let's uh, start with a case. You're called to a critical access hospital for a 65 year old male with a head injury. You land and you're introduced to the patient. <clears throat> Excuse me. You'll be transporting back to the mothership, which is about 35 minutes away. He was singing while he was, uh, fell while singing karaoke with his wife, stumbled to his chair, and then became unresponsive. Um, he was intubated in the ED and is on fentanyl and uh, propofol drips. Uh, apparently had a PE three years ago, and he's taken Xeralto for that. The ED got a basic uh, head CT and some labs, and uh, that's what the head CT looks like. Obviously, he's got a large interparenchymal bleed. Um, so you and your partner land, and uh, you, of course, introduce yourself to the hospital staff, and uh, everybody's happy. You take your white gloves off, and uh, now it's time to get to work. So if you're going to understand bleeding, you got to briefly understand clotting. This is what a hematologist look like. looks like, uh, you'll notice, by the uh, wrinkled lab coat and the fact that uh, they're never seen in the hospital after dark. So uh, that's a hematologist. Um, I am not a hematologist, however, I'm just a peepaw, so, right? So I'm going to tell you what we do on the front lines, not necessarily what the hematologists think is the greatest thing to do. So based on that, um, hematologists love slides like this. Um, I show you this just to make you believe that I'm smart, which is not really the case at all. But what I'm really trying to demonstrate is that if you look at the onset of action, from baseline, that's in the uh, y-axis over here, you see how rapidly the uh, case centra, which is the primary four-factor PCC, raises um, and gets up to a therapeutic level. So you can see it's almost straight up um, over plasma. So the point is that case centra better than plasma. All right. Some basics of the coagulation cascade, you know, there's an intrinsic and an extrinsic, extrinsic pathway. And what you need to know from this slide, although we could talk about it for 15 minutes, what you really need to know is that factor 10 is where the extrinsic and the extrinsic and intrinsic coagulation factors meet, right? So when we talk about factor 10 inhibitors, that's where the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways meet. Um, and this talks you, to you just a little bit about the most common factor 10A inhibitors, which are rivaroxaban, get it with the X, apixaban, get it with the X. That's how you know they're 10A inhibitors. And that's where they um, are activated right there at factor 10A. 
Um, Coumadin occurs up here um, as well as right here. And then dabigatran, which is a direct thrombin inhibitor, is down here between prothrombin and thrombin. So let's talk about stuff that really matters. So when, you, when you're looking at evidence and you're looking for guidance from the evidence about how to manage things, you have to understand what level of evidence means. And when we talk about level one evidence, those are high quality randomized controlled trials. Level two evidence is lower quality and they're kind of sketchy. Level three is equal parts sketchiness in science. So I kind of think of it like this. Um, this is where level one evidence comes from. Level two evidence and level three evidence is just a bunch of guys sitting around talking and they come up with the, what do you guys do? Well, I'll tell you what we do. Well, this is what we do. Well, this is what I think everybody else should do. All right. So it is. So those are what we call, when you, every, anytime you hear consensus guidelines, this is what I want you to think of. These are, this is how consensus guidelines are formed. All right. So let's talk about the drugs. With respect to anticoagulation, there are the antiplatelet agents, of which aspirin is one, and there are obviously others. There are vitamin K antagonists, which is things like warfarin and factor 10 inhibitors, get it with the X again, rubberoxaban, apixaban, and direct thrombin inhibitors, which is pradaxin. Um, of the antiplatelet agents, these are the most common ones. Um, I think likely you will most commonly see aspirin, clopidogrel, and ticagrelor. Um, Prasigrel is something I think we don't see as much anymore. There are pockets of uh, believers, but largely not as, not as popular. They're all antiplatelet agents. And they work on COX-1 inhibition, or they bind to G2B3A inhibitors. And when, I, when you think about G2B3A inhibitors, I want you to think of G2B3A inhibitors are like Velcro on the outside of red blood cells. It's what allow red blood cells to stick to each other. So when you inactivate those G2B3A inhibitors, you turn off the Velcro and it really prevents that adhesion of platelets. Vitamin K antagonist, obviously rat poison, um, particularly warfarin, that's what we think about. And that is uh, where it first came about. Um, they antagonize the synthesis of factors two, seven, nine, and 10, as well as protein CNS. So they work in multiple places. With warfarin, the efficacy is, me efficacy is measured by the INR. The problem is it requires frequent monitoring when the weather changes, they eat chocolate chip ice cream, spinach, or a thousand other things that can affect their INR. The results are highly variable. They either have to go to a clinic to have their INR managed, or some places do it at home with home testing. It's just, for lack of a better term, it's a pain in the ass and the results are highly variable. Um, the good news is it's damn near free. So if you work in an inner city system, you're gonna see lots of free medications because everybody likes free. Um, factor 10A inhibitors are things like rivaroxaban, apixaban, those are Xeralto and Eliquis. Um, they block the activation of factor 10A at the junction of the intrinsic and extrinsic clotting cascade. Um, they're not free. Um, they're cheaper than they used to be because they are now generic, but they're not free. They don't require frequent monitoring. Uh, we can, we know that when we give people Coumadin, the first couple days of it that we prescribe it, it has a prothrombotic effect. So what if we're taking someone from Coumadin, uh, transitioning them to Coumadin from something else, we have to leave the something else on when we start the Coumadin because it can be prothrombotic in the first couple days. Uh, these oral 10A agents are not like that. Uh, the, all the evidence says they're not inferior to warfarin. The evidence hasn't really determined that they're better, but they're not inferior and they have less incidence of spontaneous ICH. So in my mind, that makes them um, more preferable. Um, the direct thrombin inhibitors is primarily in Prodaxa. Um, that is also not inferior to warfarin. It is primarily indicated in non-valvular AFib, but um, you'll see it off-labeling used in other things. But the primary one you're going to see are the factor 10A inhibitors. And the question that we're always faced with is, somebody comes in on a factor 10A, when do we reverse, reverse them and how do we do it? So we'll talk about that here in just a minute. So let's talk now about reversal. So vitamin K... Um, synthesizes those coagulation factors 
And if you give it IV, it will impact the INR in 24 hours. It's not going to fix it. It doesn't give you immediate bleeding cessation, but it will help you in 24 hours. Um, it is a two-pronged approach, but it is certainly helpful. I would always advocate that you give vitamin K at the time you give the other reversal agents. K-Centra or four-factor PCC is probably the most common drug that we have available to us in critical care. It's expensive, but not expensive enough that you get a call from the director of pharmacy when you order it, and the evidence is pretty good for it. So K-Centra has factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, which is pretty similar to the factors that vitamin K impacts, 2, 7, 9, and 10. So um, that's why it works. Um, it also works in protein CNS. It's similar or better than fresh frozen plasma. And when I say FFP, I also mean liquid plasma. There is no real definitive benefit between liquid plasma and fresh frozen plasma other than liquid plasma is immediately available to flight crews. It rapidly corrects the INR to 1.3 in about 30 minutes. And that is, the evidence is not really great. There's a sliding dose schedule for the dose of case center that you give patients based on what their INR is and based on where their hemorrhage is. But that's not something that likely you're going to be uh, calculating. I suspect you'll just have a protocol that you follow or you'll talk to pharmacy before you give it. Even in the ICU, I always talk to pharmacy. Um, it is expensive. It's somewhere around 2,500 to 3,500 bucks, still cheaper than a funeral. Um, and it works. It will take them from INR crazy to INR normal in about 30 minutes. It is about the cost of a good Rocky Mountain elk hunt. So if I'm a hunter, I think about everything with respect to the cost of things. Um, so if you're going to go, uh, Use case centra, it costs about what a Rocky Mountain elk hunt costs. Um, Praxabind is a humanized monoclonal antibody. As soon as you hear those words, you got to know it's expensive. It has 350 times more affinity to thrombin than dabigatran. So it's going to reverse uh, people who are on Pradaxin. Um, it does reverse the coagulation effects in about 30 minutes. Um, but you don't have bleeding cessation for 11 and a half hours. And therein is the key. And I'm just gonna give you my off-label uh, editorial opinion on that is uh, I think it is the equivalent to mobile stroke units. Um, we know that mobile stroke units can serve as a great billboard, patrol the community with your logo emblazoned all over it, but we don't really have any evidence that says giving you the TPA in an hour and a half versus two hours really makes any difference. So um, Praxibind, I think, is similar in that uh, it, it gives you bleeding cessation in 11 and a half hours, um, but there's no evidence at that, at that point that it's going to impact mortality. And uh, this just illustrates that. It's just uh, by the time they've bled for 11 and a half hours, that's water under the bridge. So all the studies that showed pace and improvements were based, were funded by uh, Beringer Engelheim, which uh, if you remember my levels of one, two, and three in evidence, you decide uh, which level of evidence that falls under when it's uh, conducted by the drug company. And the cost is about the equivalent of a uh, British Columbia black bear hunt. Much more expensive. You can kill a lot of elk for what it's going to cost you to kill a black bear in Victoria, British Columbia. And then there's Andexanet Alpha. That's a recombinant factor 10A decoy protein, binds to and sequesters 10A inhibitors, reduces 10A activity by 90% in two to five minutes. But there's no mortality benefit. So it's a really cool drug. It's really expensive. It has a really cool name, but none of the studies that looked at it showed any mortality benefit. And the cost? is about that of a grizzly bear hunt in Newfoundland, which is going to be three times what a black bear hunt is. Any bear that eats people is always more expensive to hunt. You heard it here first. All right, so what's the Neurocritical Care Society say? They say that with antiplatelet agents, level one says stop the agents when they have a traumatic ICH. 
Level three, do platelet function testing. If you're in a big center, that's something you can do. And if they're planning surgery, that you should give the patient platelets. There's not any good evidence that says that given platelets is helpful, but we give it because we don't really have anything else to do. And then there's always DDAVP, um, not as popular because it's super cheap. Nobody's making any money off of it. And the evidence is not really great. DDAVP works on um, platelet efficacy. So what's the Neurocritical Care Society about vitamin K antagonists? That you give uh, 10 milligrams of vitamin K IV, you follow it up with four-factor PCC or k -Centra. And that FFP is of little to no benefit, but it's better than a ham sandwich. So um, if you, it's all you have, it's better than nothing. Um, if you fly out to a remote hospital, um, we always give it. I always give it. I think most programs give it, um, but it's certainly not as good as K-Centra. K-Centra is the league leader. Factor 10A inhibitors, activated charcoal within two hours of ingestion, which is almost never going to happen, that they're going to fall within two hours of taking their uh, Xeralto. Um, and Dexanet Alpha with the double asterisk. Case Centra's four-factor PCC. Again, that is really the gold standard. And again, you can use fresh frozen plasma, but the benefit is really pretty sketchy. But it certainly is better than nothing. The key is to give the case center rapidly. The other thing to keep in mind is the half-life of these NOACs or the 10A inhibitors is pretty short. So it really drops off after eight to 12 hours. So if they took their morning dose and they whacked their noggin before they took their evening dose, most of that Xeralta was gone by the time they get to you in the emergency department or by the time you fly out to get him. Now, if they just took their evening dose and got out in the middle of the night and tripped over their dog and whacked their head, then you're a couple, three hours from their second dose, then there is certainly a benefit to given the uh, four-factor PCC. But uh, it's just, a, it's an informed decision you have to make with the patient, with the patient's family and whoever your policymakers are where you're at. But I think most of us will lean towards just giving it. Um, direct thrombin inhibitors, again, the activated charcoal within a couple hours. Uh, Praxabind, if you have it, most places don't. And then we're back to four-factor uh, PCC and dialysis. Um, there are not going to be a lot of people that are too excited about putting in a dialysis line and dialyzing somebody who is coagulopathic, but it is renally cleared. So uh, the summary reversal is that by the time you get a patient who's actively bleeding and you're faced with reversal, um, this is really the situation you're in. Um, it's very difficult to get out in front of coagulation or anticoagulation with reversal. Um, and I always, one of my favorite sayings, if you've ever heard me on the podcast, it's kind of like peeing your pants in the dark. It gives you a warm feeling, but at the end of the day, it probably doesn't make a huge difference. We do it, but we don't have any reason to believe that it's really helpful in large volume hemorrhage. Now, if you have somebody who has small hemorrhage, then certainly you can reverse them and it could prevent the hemorrhage from getting any worse. But large volume hemorrhage, most of the damage is done by the time you lay eyes on them. Um, as you might, some of you might know, I come from a fire department background and we had a saying at the fire department that was, it's a lot harder to dry it. You can always dry it out, but you can't unburn it. And that's the case with coagulation. Once, the, but once they've got a head full of blood, it doesn't really matter what you give them. They have a head full of blood. So none of the anticoagulation reversal is going to fix that. It's going to be more helpful in small volume hemorrhage. So um, that's what I got for you. Uh, with respect to, and that's the, your 10 minutes, as Corey Slovis says, that 10 minutes or five minutes of uh, anticoagulation or coagulopathy reversal. Um, how, I don't know how you're doing questions here, Sam. Is there anything that uh, we can do? I'm sure we're tied no, uh, time, right? Great. No, you're perfect. Great. Great job, Dan. Thank you. Uh, Chad, did you have any questions? Yep, there was just one here, Dan. Um, what is the alternative for patients who don't accept blood transfusions? Uh, a hug, um, palliative care. And um, I'm not certain, to be honest, if 
uh, people who don't accept blood transfusions because there is a, a monoclonal component of K-Centra, um, if that counts it, in that population as uh, a blood product. Um, you don't have to be typed and screened for it, um, which in my experience in critical care has been kind of the, the deal breaker. They, those people typically won't accept plasma because it requires type and screen, but um, K-Centra does not require type and screen. So um, I think that would probably be okay unless they have a particular uh, bias against it. Thanks, Dan. Sure thing.